Thanks so much for joining us again. It is so good to be here. Um, we're hoping that as fall comes in, um, we'll not only have our on-site for um, worship and teaching under the tent, but that we'll be able to have various different gatherings as you feel comfortable, maybe in homes, maybe in the church building where we can meet and interact with the video content that we're producing. So just be praying about how the church might develop into that new um, realm of ministry. Um, remember, we need your gifts, so go to issaquah.cc slash give. There's all sorts of ways to, to mail a check there. You can find our mailing address or uh, set up a recurring gift that would really help us as we head into the fall. We're excited to be doing ministry together, having our gifts used for the service in the kingdom. And we're seeing that happen more and more and more. And today's sermon is going to help us remember that, that we are a gift to be given. We have gifts that are meant to be given. So let's sing out to the giver of all good gifts. Let's worship Jesus together.
God so loved the world. Last week we got to hear from Chris Goff about his, the first part of the gift or the giftings that God has given to the church. Those gifts being apostle, prophet, evangelist, shepherd, and teacher, or pastor, teacher. And so we got to hear about the first two, and just the kind of the idea that, that God has given us senses, uh, taste and touch and smell and sight, and Chris has been correlating those. And I want to play the, the second half of that for you, where he talks about evangelism, shepherd, teacher. And, of course, available online is the full sermon in its length. But I wanted to break it up for you so you could have some time to ponder that, watch that playlist that was suggested in, in last week's um, video. And then just take a listen to how God might be using this to spur you on to use your gifts in the church. Because if you're not using your gift, it's not really a gift then, is it? So I'm going to play just a few clips to catch you back up on what his main point was, and then he'll finish off the rest of the sermon. But I would just say, you know, really the purpose of sharing out of Ephesians 4 today is that you are critical in the proper functioning of the body of Christ. Um, as we look at this passage today, as we talk through this idea of gifting, uh, my hope is that you would have a sense of God doesn't give you a gift for no reason. <laughs> God gives you a gift so that you could use your gift. So essentially what he's saying is we're giving some gifts. He mentions five gifts, apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. He's saying, I'm giving you these gifts. Why? These are leadership gifts. Why? To equip you, to equip the body of Christ into works of ministry so that they, so that they will be built up so that they'll reach maturity, so that they'll have the full knowledge of the Son of God. And, um, and, and then this, I mean, it's kind of a catch-all, right? So that they will attain the whole measure of the fullness of Christ, the whole measure of the fullness of what Christ intended through these five leadership gifts. What about evangelists? We've got prophet, or apostles and prophets, uh, vision and hearing. What about the evangelist? Um, the evangelist is someone who tells the story of the gospel. We think the evangelist is someone who converts someone else. That's the role of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit changes people's hearts. The evangelist is someone who loves to tell the story, right? The old hymn, I love to tell the story. They remember the story. They remind others to tell the story, right? Like, hey, let's not forget. Don't forget, Israel. Like, don't forget what happened to Moses, how God led us out of Egypt, how God spread the Red Sea, how God... Remember, this is the actual thing Jesus has to do. Go and be my witnesses. Don't forget what you saw here, that Christ was died, buried, resurrected, ascended to heaven, is now seated at the left hand of the Father. Do not forget the story. Share this story. Be my witnesses. Um, and and uh, the sense of smell... <clears throat> In, in, as one of our senses, it's actually a sense tightly connected to memory. Um, when you smell that chocolate chip cookie in the oven, right, you are immediately brought back to grandma's house, or you're immediately brought back to home when mom used to make those cookies, or college when you used to buy the cheap, you know, uh, uh, little pre-made cookie doughs in, in the dairy section, <laughs> and throw them in the oven, you know. Um, a friend of mine is a realtor. He, he throws the cookies in there when he's doing an open house so that when people come in, they can remember what it's like to have a home, you know. Maybe this could be your home, right? It's a, it's a great technique. Um, but smell is tightly connected to uh, memory. In fact, um, uh, there is a disease called anosmia, which is the loss of smell, and it's directly related to amnesia which is loss of memory. So, uh, and actually it's a symptom of, of COVID. My wife actually had anosmia. She lost her ability to smell, which therefore really affected her sense of taste and some other things. But amnesia and anosmia, very tightly, it's the same center of the brain. It's the same part of the brain that functions 
smell and memory are related. So the evangelist is always bearing witness to what goes before. He's always remembering in assurance of what will come. Hey, we can trust this God. He conquered death. This is what's going on with an evangelist. Um, uh, also in the notes, we're going to put a, a test you can take. And in this test, it says, hey, maybe maybe this will help orient you. Or maybe God has gifted you in one of these ways. Uh, it's, a, it's a relatively brief test. And I couldn't believe it. I got evangelists. And I'm like, evangelist? I don't go into parking lots and hand out tracts. And, and then when I thought of it as, no, 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 you love to tell the story. It's like, oh, yeah, that's my favorite thing to do of all time. In fact, this sermon I thought would be short. It might go really long because I could keep talking all day because I love to tell this story. But the, uh, Jesus warns us that the, uh, or Paul warns us that the aroma of Christ when telling people the gospel is a pungent smell to some people. They won't like that smell. They've got a bad, they've got a bad memory around the church or they have a bad assumption about who the church is or about who Jesus is or about who Christians are. So, that story can be a life-giving smell to some, or what's the word? An offensive smell to others. Um, this is the gift of evangelism. Who loves to tell that story? If we don't have the story central to the body of Christ, this is a real problem. This is a real problem for us. Um, let me read this little passage from Corinthians 2, uh, 14 to 17. But thanks be to God, who always leads us as captives in Christ's triumphal possession and uses us to spread the aroma of the knowledge of him everywhere. For we are to God the pleasing aroma of Christ. We are a pleasing aroma to God of Jesus among those who are being saved and those who are perishing. To the one, we are an aroma that brings death. To the other, an aroma that brings life. And who is equal to such a task? Unlike so many, we do not peddle the word of God for profit. On the contrary, in Christ, we speak before God with sincerity as those sent from God. In other words, hey, God sent us to tell this story. We've got to tell it. We can't, we can't mess around with this. This is too important. Um, so that evangelist, critical gift to build the fullness of the body of Christ. Let's talk about pastors. Um, <clears throat> the sense of touch. Uh, and and the gift of the pastoral gift. I remember, and I, I wish it was in this um, five senses playlist that'll be in the in the uh, comments. But there was this this scene I saw in a documentary of Mother Teresa, and there was this kid child who, out of hunger, didn't have um, energy to cry. Uh, maybe four or five year old kid, but was in this crib just shaking, and people were trying to talk and. This, this child would not make eye contact, and it was, it was just a really desperate, difficult situation. But it was in a room with a hundred other kids, you know? I mean, it was, it was a situation where basic needs were lacking and needed. And um, no, the, the baby was, uh, the child was unresponsive, and they called Mother Teresa over, and she says something, the, the child doesn't respond, and so she just takes her hand, she just starts rubbing the chest of this this young little boy and not just like but like a, a pressurized pushing rubbing and what happens is you didn't really realize it but the child stops shaking the child's eyes connect and look up at her and they get really big just like who is this that would touch me who would reach out their hand and touch something that is not valuable. Who would care for me? This is the gift of the pastor. They care about people. How central is this to being the body of Christ? What are the greatest commandments? Love the Lord your God with all your heart and love your neighbor. Care about your neighbor, right? This is so central, the, the, the sense of touch reaching out to those who are hurting and offering comfort, to those who need encouragement, protection, hope, guidance. You know, the pastor often engages, as, as Paul says, there's unclean parts of the body, right, uh, that, that need special attention and special care. This pastoral gift is so powerful because it reveals the love of the Father to a hurting world, a hurting and broken world. 
touches the first developed human sense in babies. It's the first sense. It's the primary sense that provides belonging and human connection. Without touch, you know, there, there's no bonding, right? There, there is no um, connection between mother and child. Human touch is so important. Um, touch has the power to soothe, to heal, to connect, to nourish. Um, and what's amazing is where the eyes are located here, the ears are located here, taste is here, smell is here. The nervous system that's connected to touch, it's the whole body. It's almost like this pastoral gift of caring for your neighbor. It almost gets the position of, hey, by the way, all of you need to take note of this gift. All of you need to be able to, to care and love your neighbor. By the way, <clears throat> it seems pretty primary, right? It's the John 3.16, for God so loved the world. If we don't understand the love of the Father, the care, it's kind of hard to do anything else, right? The whole, the whole statement, uh, I don't care what you know until I know you care, right? That idea, that, that primary, that first sense that a baby develops that creates all this connectivity and all this attachment. Luke 15, 3 through 5, then Jesus told them this parable, suppose one of you has a hundred sheep and loses one of them. Doesn't he leave the 99 in the open country and go after the lost sheep until he finds it? And when he finds it, he joyfully puts it on his shoulders and carries it home, right? It's just so powerful. Uh, this idea of the pastoral gift is so, so important. Um, let's look at the last one. Some he gave to be teachers. Uh, if you're paying attention, you know which one we haven't, which sense we haven't talked about yet, which is the sense of taste. Um, the teacher, the teacher's job, frankly, is to bring God's truth, right? The ability to teach and communicate and um, uh, the truth of God's word, right? Remember back in, in um, Acts chapter 6, where the apostles are like, well, we have to bring the truth of God's word. So we, we can't go wait on tables right now. We're actually teaching. We have to teach or else people will not understand the fullness of Christ. And so this teacher, they help people to know what's right. They help people to know what's wrong. They help people to walk in obedience to God. And um, this is the, 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 um, the, the sense of taste is so critical because if I put something in my mouth that doesn't taste good, what do I do? I spit it out. That doesn't belong in this body. We need teachers, brothers and sisters, who can say to us, hey, I know it's popular to say that right now, but that does not belong in the body of Christ. So let me show you where, where it says that. The teacher functions as the gateway to the body, the things that are going to be ingested, not sound waves, you know, not, not smells. This is like like food, meat, things that are going to nourish the body have to go through the gateway of taste. The things that are going to build up the body have to go through the gateway of the teacher. Um, otherwise, we're going to be eating spoiled food. We're going to get sick, right? Um, uh, when you taste what is good to eat, however, you're filled, you have life, you have energy. Those things that you eat are now providing, you know, nourishment so that you can function and and. Uh, in the world. Psalm 34, 8, taste and see that the Lord is good. So the number one job of this teacher is to say, taste and see the Lord is good. You want to know the story? Go talk to the evangelist. You know, they'll, they'll tell you the whole story, but please taste and see that this is good. Proverbs 15, 9, the Lord detests the way of the wicked, but he loves those who pursue righteousness. Believe me, it matters <laughs> that, you know, sin is a seed that leads to death. Righteousness, a seed that leads to life. The goal of the teacher isn't to judge a bunch of people, but to work with that caring pastoral gift. I love that they put those together. Paul puts those together. In fact, some people think it's the same gift. I, I don't agree, but it says um, some to be evangelists, some to be pastors and teachers. They put some together, pastors and teachers. Kind of like hearing and sight go together. Um, this idea that <clears throat> pastors and teachers go together. We can speak the truth, teacher, in love, pastor, right? Speaking the truth in love is so important. Um, and so let's look back at Ephesians 4 here. What happens when we have these gifts functioning well in our body? Um, 
Well, verse 14, then we will no longer be infants tossed back and forth by the waves and blown here and there by every wind of teaching and by the cunning and craftiness of men and their deceitful scheming. Instead, speaking the truth in love, there it is again, we will in all things grow up into him who is the head, that is Christ. From him the whole body, joined and held together by every supporting ligament that grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work. Um, this, this work is so important to understand. This passage is so un important to understand as we consider the work of the church. If Pastor Aaron is expected to be the real Christian here, and we'll pay you to do it, Aaron, um, we've got a real problem on our hands. One, it means the rest of us are not growing to maturity. Uh, two, it means that we're expecting Aaron to have all five of these gifts. We're expecting Aaron to have be the eyeball and the ear and the nose and the, and the taste and the entire uh, nervous system. Um, I think that's called idolatry. No, we are all unique parts of the body. It's our functioning together. This is the whole message of Ephesians. It's our functioning together that brings about uh, a functioning body, a powerful body, a healthy body, a stable body, a body that is able to be um, to to perform the works God has called us to do. Um, <clears throat> uh, a friend of mine, <clears throat> Justin and and Matthew, there are two pastors at a church called Calvary the Hill in Capitol Hill. And recently, uh, when the chop happened, right, the the autonomous zone or the Chaz, um, this autonomous zone happened to uh, go right around. Calvary the Hills Church. So their church is now in the autonomous zone. And they prayed about it. What do we do here? And they said, we need to open every day. Of course, this never makes the news, but they were open every day. They would, they had water. They had, they had um, some basic kind of things to help people. They allowed people to use their restroom or maybe get out of the sun. They offered to pray with people, to talk with people, to discuss with people. They led a number of people to Christ. They they, they did all kinds of stuff. Um, uh, and and I, I asked Justin, I said, what was that like? I mean, that had been kind of crazy. And this is his first reaction. He could have named any number of things. He could have named the violence that was going on. He could have named the chaos. He could have named the, uh, <clears throat> the, the rioting. He could have named the, the tear gas. What he said was, he goes, it was the coolest thing. God just started giving gifts to everybody at our church. He's like, these people who... All of a sudden, like, whoa, when did you become this powerhouse? Like, like you're going out there doing these things. I had no idea you were capable of doing these things. But all of a sudden, it's like, no, when we're doing the work of the body, when we're functioning as a body, all of a sudden we see the need for this gift. If I'm laying in bed all day, I don't know the value of my ankles. But when I start walking, boy, it sure is nice to have a functioning ankle. And so what happened, he said, is that he just saw gifts being poured out everywhere people's gifts being re renewed and built up, people getting new gifts, people, he just kept talking about gifts, gifts, gifts. What happened when, when his church got basically swamped by <clears throat> the chop? Uh, God started pouring out gifts because they went, they, they opened, right? Um, this is our invitation here, I think, uh, as we look at this passage today. It says, Paul says that God gave unique gifts to the church to equip the church for works of ministry, to equip people for works of ministry. I'll close by just sharing this one story about Crazy Bob. So Bob, um, <clears throat> he, uh, he decided that they were going to go somewhere in the world that was hurting and be salt and light. And so they decided to go to northern Afghanistan because at the time uh, the war was in full function and this was a hurting part of the world, so they decided to go. They found a local church there that was basically in hiding. And they said, hey, we're going to come. We're going to bring some of our leaders, right? Our our staff, essentially, is what he meant. Um, this, by the way, Ephesians 4 says nothing about staff. It just talks about leadership gifts. But so they go out there and they travel. And <clears throat> as he was coming back, he thought, this place needs a school. And we've got educators. This place needs a building. And we've got construction guys. This place needs businesses. We've got business leaders and business owners. 
this place, and he just, the vision, right? He had that apostolic gift, and he started just vision, vision, vision. And all of a sudden, he said, everybody goes to northern Afghanistan. By the way, this is a war zone. He's like, everybody's going to, to Afghanistan. And he told stories to me and, and our team at Multnomah for two full days of all the things that the people in his congregation did in northern Afghanistan because they went. Um, I brought a little book to show you. Um, <clears throat> the best thing about this book is you don't have to read it because everything you need to learn is right on the cover. Peter Block, it says, the answer to how is yes. How are we going to do this? You say yes. <laughs> how are we going to be this full body? You say yes, you go for it. How reveals itself as you go. Until you go, you don't know how. The answer to how is yes. How do we move forward? How do we go forward in maturity? How do we serve? How do we love our neighbor? We go. And God starts to give these gifts and God starts to uncover these gifts and God starts to bless you and he starts to open up avenues and he starts to give people vision and he starts to speak to people and he starts to tell people, hey, be really careful. You need to speak up, teacher, because we're going a funny direction. And he starts to tell people, hey, those widows are actually not being cared for. And he starts to tell people, go and be my witnesses and tell the story. What, a, what an amazing invitation we have to be a part of this body. Uh, let me pray for us. Lord, we thank you so much <clears throat> that uh, you've equipped us, that you've given us these gifts, that you've given us uh, a body to function in, um, both physically with our five senses, but also a body, your body, that we function in with one another. Lord, I thank you that you haven't poured out all the gifts into one super person. Lord, but even, even your son Jesus, when you walked this earth, you sent the disciples out because that's part of maturity. That's part of how you grow. And, and Lord, you said to Peter, I'm going to build my rock on this person. Or Peter's going to be my rock on which the church will be built. Why? Because he had a really special and amazing gift. Lord, thank you for, for engaging with us. Thank you for leading us forward. Thank you for not just solving the problem by snapping your finger, but Lord, by leading us into bringing hope and healing to a hurting and broken world. We thank you, Lord, for these gifts. We pray that you'd reveal these gifts to Issaquah Christian Church. Um, Lord, that people would start to have a conversation with you. Lord, how, how might I help lead the body? How might I help give direction to the things going on here? Lord, we thank you so much for each person in your body. And we just pray that we would walk with joy and into the fullness that you've intended. We pray in your name. Amen.
above all names. You stand alone. I stand. As we prepare for communion, I want you to think about that, whether you believe it or not, that God has a gift that he's placed in you to be used in the church. It's not really a gift until it's been given, and so it's possible that you were not aware of how God's been gifting you, and maybe we need to put ourselves in some situations where the gifts are needed and I'll tell you, when, when Christ is in you and he is moving through you, there is no better experience of life. In fact, we are going to participate in that right now. Or, uh, on the night Jesus was betrayed, remember, he took the bread and he broke it and he said, This is my body, which is broken for you. Eat this in remembrance of me. Then he took the cup. He said, This is the covenant in my blood. We take Jesus in. The experience is, is so, so combined with our experience, his life in our life. We, we drink this. Yes, it purifies us from our sin and makes us inhabitable space, but so that the Holy Spirit can live out his life through us. And so we drink in this covenant, remembering Jesus' death and resurrection. We look forward to his coming, when he will bring all this around, and when the gifts will be fully expanded, and we will rule and reign with him. the stage and set the sound and lights ablaze if that's the measure you must take to crush the idols jerk the pews and all the decorations too until the congregations few then have revival Tell your friends that this is where the party ends Until you're broken for your sins You can't be social Then seek the Lord and wait for what He has in store And know that great is your reward So just be hopeful Cause you can sing all you want to Yes, you can sing all you want to. You can sing all you want to and still get it wrong. Oh, worship is more than a song. Take a break from all the plans that you have made And sit at home alone and wait for God to whisper Beg Him please to open up His mouth and speak And pray for real upon your knees until they blister Shine the light on every corner of your life 
until the pride and lust and lies are in the open. So read the word and put to test the things you've heard until your heart and soul are stirred and rocked and broken. Cause you can sing all you want to. Yes, you can sing all you want to. You can sing all you want to and still get it wrong. Oh, worship is more than a song. We must not worship something that's not even worth it. Anything I put before my God is an idol. Anything I want with all my heart is an idol. Anything I can stop thinking of is an idol and anything i give all my love is an idol because we can sing all we want to yes we can sing all we the sound and lights ablaze if that's the measure you must take to crush the idols it's our prayer that god would richly bless you that as you go into your coming week that you would experience his power flowing through you his presence among us and as we as a church engage new projects and the new ideas of the ways that we can be the church in this new time we are called to live up <laughs> to our calling a uh, high calling that we've received and so let's march forward let's head out and serve the world that god has placed right at our doorsteps <laughs>